of God and for the gift he has lavishly bestowed on us. We thank him for our lives that he has preserved. We thank him for the hope and the faith we still exercise in him. May his name be praised now and forevermore. Hallelujah. We bless the name of the Lord once again for giving his church the opportunity to be in his presence. And not only to be in his presence, but also to be here to share the word of God and the food that he has prepared on the table for us. We are praying. Our Heavenly Father, we bless your holy name. Once again, we are at your feet for you to nourish us, for you to feed us again, for you to bring us closer to yourself. And to open our eyes to see and understand your will and your way for us. I commit all my hearers all over the world into your hands. That your gracious hand will be mighty upon them. That you cause the opening of their hearts to the reception of your word. That your word will penetrate their hearts. And they will acknowledge that indeed Jesus Christ is Lord. May your lordship rule now and forevermore in every heart on this earth in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I would like us to take our scripture reading from the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4 to 9. Numbers, chapter 21, verse 4 to 9. I read. Then the journey then they journeyed from Mount Hall, Hall by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged and on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And our souls lose this wordless bread. So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they beat the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he will take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fairy serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is beaten, when he looks, it, when he looks at it, shall live. Hallelujah. 
So Moses made a brown serpent, serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the brown serpent, he lived. I want us to repeat the verse 9. So Moses made a brown serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was. If a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the brown serpent, he lived. God, who took the people of Israel from the land of Egypt and from the land of slavery, journey with them, and from the onset of the journey, the spirit of rebellion was at work in the hearts of the people of Israel. And according to the word of God in Numbers 14, he says the people rebelled against him ten times. Ten times even before they were able to cross to the promised land. So it means the spirit of disobedience and rebellion was really prominent among the people of Israel. Once again here too, they rebelled against God when they were supposed to go around Edom to be able to cross to get to the promised land. Because they became weary, they became tired. There was no food, there was no water. However, these people had forgotten that it is the same God who was feeding them with manna from heaven. It was the same God who gave them water from the rock. Everything they needed, God judiciously provided for them. And yet, when little difficult or discomfort comes their way, they forgot everything. And they began complaining, murmuring, cursing Moses here and there. And once again, they did the same thing when things were not going their way. The Bible said they were impatient, and they began to curse God. They began to curse Moses. And as a result of their disobedience and rebelliousness, God sent poisonous serpents to bite them. And as the snakes were biting them, they were dying. And the people came to themselves, went back to Moses, and pleaded, please pray for us, for the Lord to take away the snakes from us. In the Garden of Eden, the people rebelled. And when the people rebelled, God pronounced a curse on man. That the very day you eat of these fruits, surely you will die. In the same vein, the people of Israel rebelled here. And as they rebelled against God, God sent snakes to kill them. However, the merciful and the compassionate God the God who is loving and caring, who doesn't want us to perish, sent a redeemer, sent another snake, a broad snake, a snake that was lifted on the pole. And the command is, anyone who will look at the snake will live. The command is, anyone who will look at the snake will live. Go throughout generation. Even from the time of Aden, had made a promise. And the promise was that, that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And the seed of the serpent will also bruise the feet or the heel of the seed of the woman. God had made a declaration of redemption, even in his anger, even in his, in his pronouncement of curse upon man. So in the Garden of Eden, he said, if you eat these fruits, surely you will die. When the people rebelled, they, become, they became, they started dying. But God made a provision. Today, my message is, the standard of God cannot be compromised. The standard of God cannot be compromised. If the snake bites you and you are dying, the only standard I have set for you is to look at the bronze serpent that has been lifted on the tree. When God was angry with the whole human generation and wanted to wipe away all human race, he remembered Noah. 
And he said, anyone who is able to enter the ark shall be saved. When God called Abraham, he told Abraham, I will make you a blessing. Anyone who blesses you shall be blessed. Anyone who curses you shall be cursed. God has a standard. And no matter who you are, no matter how old you are, no matter who you worship, whom you have believed, God has a standard. God has a standard. And he will never compromise a standard for any reason. If you lift your eyes to the bronze or serpent, you will live. The standard of God is Jesus Christ for the world. He is the accredited savior. He is the only one, the only bronze or serpent that has been lifted on high on the pole for the whole world to look out to him and be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to God except through him. That is the standard of God. God cannot go against his word because he is his word. God is unchangeable, so is his word. And when you read the book of Psalm, he says, Your word, O Lord, is established in heaven. That is Psalm 119. The word of God is established in heaven. It is immutable. It can never be changed. Because God is his word. And God is unchangeable. And as long as his word is unchangeable, he too cannot change. He watches over his word to perform. God cannot compromise his word. Because he has exalted his word above his name and even above his reputation. Though he has said that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. However, the word of God is exalted above his own name and his own reputation. And because he's not a man to lie, because he's not a man to lie, he is bound by his word. Whatever he says, he watches over it to fruition. God's word is his authority. If he breaks his word, he breaks his authority. So he cannot change his word. And God's word is infallible. He doesn't just decree. He doesn't just speak. For he sees the past. He sees the present, and he sees the future all together in one. So whatever he decrees for yesterday, for today, and for tomorrow will stand because he knows the result of his action. He's an all-knowing God. He knows the beginning from the end. Therefore, when he decrees, his decree is perfect. He's not like a man. Who has to act before we know the results of his or her action? God sees his action and the results at once. And therefore, his word cannot fail. His word cannot be faulted. And the word of God is the standard of God. It's the yardstick. It is the standard that he has raised for everyone. So whether you are low or high, it doesn't matter. The standard is the same. The standard will not be compromised for your unique peculiarities. The standard is universal. The standard is applicable to all. Praise God. We are in the COVID season. Hello. As I said, the standard of God cannot be compromised. And it is not like the system of men 
that can be patronized by bribe and corruption. God cannot go against his word. John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3 says, he did everything by his word. Nothing he did, nothing he created was made without his word. So you see, God and his word are the same. You can't separate God from his word. Neither can you separate his word from him. He is the embodiment of his word. Hallelujah. If you want to know God, know his word. If you want to find God, know his word. If you want to know his character and his nature, know his word. He is the embodiment of his word. And that's why he cannot compromise it. It is a standard he has set. And it is a standard for the whole world, for all human race. And like the bronze serpent lifted on the tree, if you look at it, you will be saved. Hallelujah. Yes, this was a symbolic or a representation of what Jesus was about to do some years. The Son of God needed to be lifted on the cross. For the book of Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there is no re redemption or no forgiveness of sin. And remember in the Garden of Eden, the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 downwards, when God was cursing the woman, he said there is going to be an enmity between you, the woman and the serpent. There is going to be an enmity between you, your woman, your seed, and the seed of the serpent. And the serpent will bruise the seed of the woman's head. And the woman's seed will also crush the feet of the serpent. So God had already indicated that there was going to be shedding of blood. And again, when God was giving the instruction to the Adam, he said, all the trees in the garden you can eat. But the tree in the middle of the garden don't eat. That is the tree of, the way of knowledge and of understanding and the tree of life. It is a tree if you eat, you have knowledge. Your eyes will open. And in the same middle, there was another tree of life. So when men ate the tree, instantly man died. And God said, now the man has become like us. Let us drive them away. He did not only drive man away from his presence, but on the tree that gives life, he put guardian angels and saw that was flashing day and night. And the essence is the man who has become like God, who is full of sin and death, will not come back and pluck the tree of life, eat, and live forever in his sin. Hallelujah. Look at the merciful God. Though we sin against him, though he punishes us, and yet he makes a provision of an escape, a provision of redemption, a provision of salvation, a provision of grace and mercy. The agenda of God was that one day, one day somebody will climb that tree of life. Hallelujah. And plant the fruit of eternal life for you and for me. So God had already instituted in the Garden of Eden that the Son of God, the Son of the woman, the seed of the woman, will one day climb that tree. And to climb that tree requires the shedding of the blood. Nobody could plant that tree without going through the sword. That's why Jesus was lifted on the tree. That's why the bronze was lifted on the tree. Because God had decreed that one day, the shedding of the blood must take place. No wonder women ever since have been shedding blood. And as I speak to you right now, over millions of women all over the world, I shed in blood. 
to remind us of the word of God, of the fall of man. Without the shedding of the blood, no one. Hallelujah. And this word God has watched over generation to generation until it was fulfilled in the life of Jesus Christ. Again, God said, from dust you came, dust you will go. Ever since he made this declaration, nobody, whether you died in the air or wherever, you don't remain in the air, you go back to the dust. He said, man will sweat. They will toy before we eat. It doesn't matter our technology. It doesn't matter our scientific advancement. We are still sweating and working hard before we put food into our mouth. He said the wages of sin is death. Up to now, we are still dying as a result of our sin. Hallelujah. One thing about God's word is that it doesn't matter even your relationship with him. Moses had a very good relationship with God. But when he sinned against God and God said, my friend, you are not crossing to the promised land, he did not break it. It doesn't matter how Moses pleaded. And when he said that, apart from Caleb and Joshua, and children below the age of 20, nobody is crossing to the promised land. Nobody crossed. All those above the age of 20, none crossed, including Moses himself. That is the word of God. He does not go back. He does not revert his word. He does not compromise his word. So Christians, we must be careful. Well, you must be careful. For what he has said will come to pass. God goes by his word. He said the virgin shall be with a son. This was predicted over 800 years ago by Isaiah. God watched over this word for over 800 years. And indeed, it was fulfilled in Mary. Hallelujah. Look at Abraham. God said, you and your wife, out of you, the seed will come. Abraham was well advanced in age. Sarah, the Bible said, had even passed the age of menopause. Yet, because God has spoken, because God has spoken, because he has decreed, it doesn't matter how old Abraham and wife were, they still gave birth to the promised seed. The word of God is active and alive. It lives from generation to generation. The word of God will never fall accomplished. The word of God will never die. The word of God is active. Because the one who speaks that word is alive forever. Hallelujah. The word is unchanging. It's the same yesterday. It's the same today and forever. So if God told the people on the desert that until you look at the serpent that has been lifted on the cross, you will surely die. Then today I am here to tell you that the gift that God has given to the world the Savior God has given to the world. The broad serpent that is lifted is Jesus Christ. The one who died on the cross. He is a credited Savior for you, for you and for me. Why is Jesus Christ the accredited Savior? Everybody will ask, why? Is God unfair? Does it mean that all those people who over the years have not known God, have not known Jesus Christ, are they all going to hell? You know, the Bible is a big book. All those who died from Adam up to the time of Jesus Christ, when Jesus went into the grave, he made his salvation plan known to them. Hallelujah. Jesus spent almost 30 years on this earth. In the grave, he spent three years. And the word of God says that before the eyes of God, a day is like a thousand of years. So the same number of days Jesus spent on this earth preaching to you and I, it was the same number of years he spent in the grave. So don't bother about those who died before Christ. They had a chance to hear the gospel. So Jesus is the greatest savior. Because prophecies concerning him had been fulfilled, that he will be born by a virgin, it was fulfilled. Hallelujah. He 
a sinless nature. You know, Adam sinned because he disobeyed God. One, because Jesus was born by a virgin without the issue of a man, there was no seed of sin in Jesus Christ. Even today, science proves it that surrogate mother do not affect the babies that incubate in their womb with their DNA. Therefore, Mary too did not affect Jesus Christ in her womb with her sinful DNA. Hallelujah. So there was no sin in Jesus Christ. Apart from that, the entrance of sin through temptation that came to him on the mountain after 40, for five, 40 days because he did not succumb and he did not disobey God and succumb to the will of Satan. Sin couldn't have an entrance to him. So Jesus' ability to overcome sin and temptation still kept him holy and righteous without sin. Praise the Lord. His death on the tree, as I initially said, initially said that God had put a fruit on the tree of life. And to go there, man needed to die. And Jesus sacrificed it. He went on the cross. So he died on the tree. What's the sacrifice that he paid for all of us? He's resurrecting our hope. Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, that Jesus is the first fruit of resurrection. And again, the same Corinthians chapter 15, the verse 17 to 18 and 30. He says that if Jesus died and he did not rise up from the grave, then we, those who believe in him, our faith is futile. And those who are dead in him, they've also died in their sin. And there is no hope for us. And that we are the most pitiable persons on this earth among all men. If Jesus died and he did not rise up again. So the resurrection is our hope. The fact that he died and he rose up again gave us the hope that he is accredited savior. There is a story told of a man of a great religion who said he would die. And when he also died, on the third day he will resurrect. So when they married him, on the third day, at the earth where he was buried shook, indicating that the man was rising up from the grave. Then as the earth shook, and the, the hope of his followers were ignited. A thing that struck from heaven above and hit the spot that the man was buried and pushed back the course. You know, Satan is powerful. He can mimic God. Just as Pharaoh's magicians and enchanters mimic Satan by producing fake snakes. But praise be to God. Who will not compromise his word? That when the fake religious leader was rising up, having, having saw his disapproval, but hitting him back to where he belonged. Only Jesus Christ is the first fruit of resurrection. And those who believe in him, even though we die, one day, one day, one day, we will hear him and we shall also be raised from the dead. A yini and a need Say you were, there be your best sorry. It's not said you didn't change the way you are sorry. Hallelujah. A grave is empty. Death could not hold him captive. All others are still in the grave, but Jesus has resurrected. His ascension. That's why we say he is the only way, the truth, and the life. He is the only one who knows where he is going. And the Bible says in the book of Acts chapter 1, verse 9, that while he was still talking to his disciples, he was being lifted up and he went into the sky. This is not a mist. And this is not just physiological ideas. This is something that really happened. Physical phenomena. That physical human beings were there to witness the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ into heaven. And Bible says that as the disciples gazed and wondered where he was going, angels came and said, my brethren, this same Jesus, that he's been lifted up, he will come one day, hallelujah, in the same way. 
He knows where he is going. We those who follow Jesus Christ, we know where we are going. We know that one day we will die. If, if we don't die, a time is coming. There shall be a trumpet call with the voice of the archangel. And the dead in Christ will rise again. And those of us who be living at that time, together with them, we shall be raptured into heaven. There is hope for us. He is soon coming. Jesus is coming back again. And he's coming back for the saints of God. For those whose garments have been purged in his blood. For a glorious church. A church without stain or wrinkle. All religions, all personalities are not the truth. They are not the way. They are not the life. They are false and deception. They are empty and meaningless. There is no hope. The only hope that God has given to mankind is Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. My brethren, my brothers who are Muslims, Hindus, Hare Krishnas, pagans, traditional religions, who are satanic worshippers, idol worshippers, unbelievers, sinners, lukewarm Christians, listen to me today that God will not compromise his standard. And the standard of God is Jesus Christ. He is the credited Savior. Don't follow the crowd. Don't say my parents worship this, my generation past, past worship this, so I will follow them. Don't follow the crowd, for there is no repentance in the grave. There is no remorse in the grave. There is no second chance in the grave. And ignorance is an excuse of the law. The father you didn't know yesterday, today you know. Today I am telling you. Today voices everywhere is telling you. Through social media, through every means, God is using to let you know that Jesus Christ is the savior that he has approved. You have no excuse. Repent today and accept Jesus as your Lord and personal savior. There is therefore hope for we Christians. That if God cannot compromise his word, then we have the full assurance that we can trust his word. We can put our faith in his word. We can depend on his word. And in the saving, if he will not compromise his standard, then he will not compromise the standard that he has set for we Christians. That he's coming to rapture a glorious church. A church with a spot, a wrinkle. A church that is spotless. A church that is radiant and glorious. He is not coming for a lukewarm church. A cultic church. He's not coming for a syncretic kind of worship. When we worship money, we worship ourselves. We worship our properties. We worship fame. No. No. He is coming for a holy church. He is coming for a righteous church. Are you ready? Christians, are we ready? For so very soon, the trumpet call will sound. Unbelievers, are you accepting our message that Jesus Christ alone is a standard that God has set for all of us, no any other? Today, I recommend Jesus to you. Today, Jesus said, come to me, all those who are weary and lame, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There is no rest in any personality. There is no rest in any image. There is no rest in any religion. Rest of salvation is in Jesus Christ, God's accredited Savior. Amen. Shall we pray? Just bow down your heads. And for a moment, remember that God's standard will not change. His standards for righteousness will not change. 
His standards for confirming his promises for your life will not change. And so take God at his word. Shall we just pray? Go ahead and pray. Go ahead and pray. Again. Yes, yes, he's coming back. He's surely coming back. comes back he will hold your hands and say that you were faithful you kept his standards that you kept his word Jesus will tell us good and faithful servants and I pray for you and I pray for us that in these turbulent times God's faithfulness will be manifested in your life. That God will fulfill his promises. That the sick will maintain their healing. Not just be healed but will maintain their healing. The oppressed will maintain their deliverance. The, those that have been liberated from the power of sin will maintain their purity. That we will keep to the standards. Standards of abundance, standards of prosperity, standards of knowing and operating in the spirit of God. Standards that will give God the cause to say, well done. Let it be said of PRWC members, well done. Let it be said of those of you watching us, well done. Let it be said of pastors, church leaders. Let it be said of those of us who are Christians. At the end of the day, that well done. Because we would have kept the standards of the Almighty God. May the gracious hand of the Lord be upon each and every one of you. God richly bless you. Amen. Amen. Alright, what shall we say to soft mommy? God richly bless you. And uh, God bless you. Just take the announcements and uh, we will be gone. Alright, so presiding will give us the announcements. Amen.